Welcome to FYI, the four-year innovation podcast. This show offers an intellectual discussion on technologically enabled disruption, because investing in innovation starts with understanding it. To learn more, visit arc-invest.com. Arc Invest is a registered investment advisor focused on investing in disruptive innovation. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. It does not constitute either explicitly or implicitly any provision of services or products by ARC. All statements made regarding companies or securities are strictly beliefs and points of view held by ARC or podcast guests and are not endorsements or recommendations by ARC to buy, sell, or hold any security. Clients of ARC Investment Management may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. Hello, and welcome to FYI, the For Your Innovation podcast. My name is Brett Winton. I am the Chief Futurist at ARC Invest. Today, I have the pleasure of having with me Emmett Savage. He is the uh, Chief Investment Officer and uh, and co-founder of My Wall Street. Emmett, hi. Delighted to be here, Brett. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. Okay, Emmett. What is My Wall Street? Can you explain My Wall Street and how you uh, co-founded it? For sure. Well, I think I'll roll back to my earliest days and I'll keep it brief, Brett. But first and foremost, I am a lifelong investor in US listed stocks and I have an unending love for the pursuit. I started stock investing when I was about 15 or 16 years of age here in Ireland, and I will invest in the US markets for the rest of my life. And I suppose what might be notable is that I have invested in numerous, maybe 20 or 30 businesses before they rose dozens and in some instances, hundreds fold. So my 25 year Kager was 20, just nearly 24%, 23.2% when I last had it checked about a year ago, and has definitely fallen off a little in the last 12 months, of course, but it's still 20 plus something percent. So my, my interest in investing started really in earnest when I was studying physics in, in DCU, Dublin City University in the early 90s, uh, during which time I, I kept a blog on the subject of stock investing. And this was at a time, you'll remember, where blogs were pretty much the only user generated content on the internet. Uh, so after years of evangelizing the transformative power of stock investing about 20 years ago. Um, my co-founder of My Wall Street, which I'll discuss in a minute, and I, we stuck an ad in the Irish Times newspaper offering free stock market education to all and sundry. Anyone interested, just come along. And this was the kernel of My Wall Street. And it was from that beginning that My Wall Street had the opportunity to disrupt stock market education and investing, primarily through innovation. So we are, John and I and our team, we're vocational scientists, I suppose. We're motivated by a simple mission, which is to get the world investing successfully. And when you know your higher purpose as a person or as a business, everything else you decide, you know, it has a road sign. So, so you know, I might start by just, if I may, Brett, talking about you know, disruptive innovation of stock investing education, if I may. Sure. Actually, let's let's pa- let me pause you for a second because I'm doing some math here in my head. And um, 20 years ago, from 2022, goes back to I think t- 2002, which is an interesting time to kind of begin investing or to begin a business. Can you talk a little bit about kind of your experience, kind of investing? your first experiences investing kind of in the midst of the dot-com boom and then how that led to my Wall Street. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And actually my Wall Street is is way younger than that. We're we're only a few years old, but definitely the 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 dot-com bubble was something that you and I both invested through and it was quite um a remarkable time in the history of retail stock investing because this thing that we're speaking across the internet was opened up to the world and we were suddenly in a position to access research, opinions, voices, papers, people, and brokerages. Everything just suddenly opened up where previously, I remember the first stock I invested in 
with my father was uh, one share in Dell in the 90s, in the early 90s. And we phoned uh, a traditional broker on Wall Street called Payne Weber. I don't even know if they're still around. And we only bought one share. I mean, it was humble beginnings. We bought one share in Dell. And the commission and the phone call cost considerably more than the share in Dell did. Way, way more. So like the cost... I, and the labor and the, uh, of that transaction was so high. And as we, as everyone has seen and heard since, like that was floored. There's no cost now. Like the expectation from the world now is is zero cost. You know, nothing beats free is, is a rough rule of the internet. So the build up to the dot com bubble was a frenzy that I remember with feelings more than uh, rational memories because uh, thanks to my first online brokerage, which I've been a client with ever since and is a wonderful broker. Um, I was buying and buying more and maximizing uh, leverage through margins, as a lot of people at that time were, because they didn't really know what a loaded gun was. And I started to buy more, and then the folio value went up more. In 1997, it doubled to 1998, and it doubled again and doubled again. And all of a sudden, I was looking at a number on a computer screen that told me I was successful, and I was wealthy, and I had made more money than I could have imagined by the age of 26, uh, which probably has a lot of parallels to certain things that happened over the last few years. But, but what it was, the, the, the lessons that were burnt into my psyche in the dot-com bubble burst, there were six golden rules that I learned from that meltdown, uh, which were learned the hard way and then further uh, supported by my dedication to suddenly learning how to want to learn how to do it properly, because I could see the transformative power of stock investing that with a, a very humble beginning, suddenly like I, I was theoretically worth more than what I'd ever earn, what I thought I was ever going to earn in my life. And that's like, that was something that was just mind blowing. So the six, there were six rules that kind of came in and I'll tell you what they're very quickly and they're very fundamental, but they're, they're hardwired into everything that my Wall Street does. The first rule is simply just get started. It's like anything, you know, you're not going to be the world's best guitarist or chess player or tennis player or baseball player if you don't get started. So get started is self-explanatory. The second is think long term, something that I know Ark espouse and like you have to take that long picture. And and that's why I talk about my 20 plus year Kager, because frankly, it's the marathon that matters. So think long term. The third golden rule that we have lived by is you never borrow money to buy. And by buying and margins, I lost my shirt. And, and you know that, I don't know who came up with that expression. No, I was born with nothing and I still have most of it left. Well, that's, <laughs> that's how I felt. <laughs> that's how I felt mid 2001. And I can remember I was away at a corporate event. I had a career working as, a, as an engineer and I was sitting in a real fancy hotel with a very slow over the air dial up connection on my laptop computer with an old tech called, uh, high speed circuit switch data or something like that. And I had this little card stuck in the side of my laptop. And I was in a cold sweat because my brokerage had locked me out. It was doing margin calls and I could see my positions being sold off. These stocks that I thought I understood, these businesses that I thought were going to be my, my ticket to a comfortable retirement age 26. And it was just an apparition. It was completely wrong. But, but never borrowing to buy was a lesson that I learned the hard way because I went from hero to zero in a very, very short period of time as a consequence of having borrowed from my broker. Just to interject there for a second, because I think there's at least the thinking long term and not borrowing to buy. Those are actually very, those are tied together in that if you borrow to buy, you're actually uh, mechanically limiting your ability to, to think long term. As in, you know, it could be a great long term business you're invested in, but you, you have kind of, you have to realize kind of that long-term value in a, in a much shorter time frame or run the risk of um, kind of getting forced out of the position. Absolutely. 
And as we all know, leverage cuts both ways. It's a wonderful thing when the market's going up. But if you owe your broker a million bucks and your folio falls from a value of two million down to one and a half million, you still owe your broker a million bucks. And that's just a plain fact of the matter. I completely agree. You've, th- you've tethered yourself to a dead weight when you borrow money unless you've got interest-free borrowings. And even if it's interest-free, I still think you shouldn't do it. You still owe that money. Um, but you're right now, thinking long-term ter- and not borrowing, are they're conjoined. They are conjoined rules. They're very, very important. I completely agree with you. Something, the fourth golden rule that, that again, I know will resonate with you and our, our experienced listeners is diversify. It's very simple, but it, it has to be said. You, you, diversification is critical to success in every field of our lives, not least of all our investments. Number five is buying what you believe in. And there was a very interesting chapter in Irish history. And by by being born here in Ireland and growing up in Ireland, we were, I was, I suppose, afforded some kind of creative distance from America because our media is entirely different to US media. Like I grew up in a country where there were two TV channels. And then we could get BBC one and two from the UK if you lived on the east coast of Ireland. Then a few more channels came in. But the kind of prevalence of television in the average kid of the 70s in Ireland is is quite the the impact on the psyche is lower. And as a as a an island, it's it's somewhere between the US and the UK, closer to the UK. Our media mostly came from the US and the UK, our entertainment. So the point I'm making is that there was a creative distance by being a stock investor, that you really had to deal with sparse facts. You, everything was brought down to a bare bones view. And I'll talk more about how I invest in a moment, but there was a story here where the incumbent telecoms provider of Ireland, which was called Aircom, it was like um, um, uh, Ma Bell or, or what's Ma Bell's grown up parent? at and Right. So if you just stood with a clipboard at the top of Dublin's busiest retail shopping street when it was being spun off by the Irish government and asked 100 people, is Aircom a model of operational efficiency? Is it a, is it a great business? Do they get what they need to do done quickly? And are you, do you feel like a customer? You would, In fact, you could have asked 10,000 people and everyone would have said no. However, when the government said, hey, everybody, buy shares in this company. <laughs> we had our ministers, our, our kind of uh, senators, if you like, on TV saying you should buy shares in this. Virtually everyone in the whole country bought shares in a company that they didn't believe in. And it was like unbelievable to watch this happening. So the fifth golden rule that exists in our in our space, um, and I'm again certain that you this resonates with you, Brad, is you've got to buy what you believe in. If you don't believe in something, why would you own it? You know, it's just, it's it's absurd to me that people buy shares in something they don't believe in. And then the, the sixth golden rule that we live by here is invest what you can when you can, which is also a cousin of never borrow to buy. So we say, get started, think long-term, never borrow to buy, diversify, buy what you believe in and invest what you can when you can. And they are the six golden rules that uh, were derived from real life lessons and then a whole pile of books that that uh, we've all read. Okay, so then carry me forward from those seem like one reasonable rules. Two, I think it's interesting how a lot of it is designed around both protecting yourself from mechanically not being able to invest for the long term and then also kind of on a um, kind of cognitive basis or cognitive bias basis, protecting yourself to be able to invest for the long term. And that if you don't, you can, somebody can pitch you an investment and you can say, Hey, that's great. I mean, I think the product's kind of crap, but I like the investment. But then are you going to stick with that kind of thesis for the long term? If, if on an underlying basis, you, you actually don't believe in it, probably not. You're probably going to get, you know, scared by the information environment around the investment between point A and and the long-term vision for the investment. And so then end up leaving at the worst possible time. Um, so, and it seems like a good way to kind of approach the market. How did you go from, hey, these are some lessons I've taken away to now here's my Wall Street? Yeah. So um, my co-founder, John, and I discovered in that ho- in those hotel meeting rooms that we'd fill from that advert we'd stuck in the Irish Times, that it was packed full of intelligent non-investors, 
people who are pursuing their own careers and professions and wanted to learn how to invest or actually wanted to invest, but didn't actually know how to do it. But the reasons, why had they not started? Like we live here in Ireland in a first world country. Why hadn't they invested? What was it in the Irish psyche that stopped at that time? Uh, property ownership was the definition of an investment in Ireland at that time. And, and uh, the, the, the dial is moving at this point. But, but the reason people don't invest comes down to one or both of two reasons, which is rational, or emotional, and it sounds very simple. But on the rational side of the fence, people at that time didn't know what broker to use, how much should they invest, what paperwork is required, what shares should I buy, and so on. These are all rational questions. Just literally, it's the left side of your brain. On the other side of your brain, feelings. Now, this is the big one. It's feelings that hold people back. In the world of stock investing, not already knowing somebody who invests is a big emotional anchor. So fear of the unknown, fear of losing money, who's going to help me, who will I talk to? These are things that are more right-brained. They're referring to something that is anchored in, in a hunch or an emotion. So John uh, Tyrrell, my co-founder and I, figured we can fix this problem. There's two piles of the what problem. There's a whole bunch of firms that, that address the what's. You know, how do I open a brokerage? Which brokerage should I use? How much does it cost? But we looked at this other thing, a room full of really smart people could see there was an emotion standing in the way and there was a way to figure this. So we flew out to Alexandria in Virginia. We met one of the founders of The Motley Fool, who backed our venture. And following that, we conscripted help from some really remarkable academics to understand why more people don't invest and how we could, uh, I suppose, dissolve the forces that are standing in their way. Uh, so over here in Ireland, we had um, a professor called Mark Kane, who's like a leading cognitive psychologist on learning. We had uh, Professor Barry Smith, who's a fellow of the European Committee on Artificial Intelligence. And over in the US, we conscripted help from uh, university professors, notably David Raska in NKU, Northern Kentucky University, a remarkable individual. So with their input, we set about identifying and breaking down the investing cognitive barriers to create a product that is today loved the world over. And, and what it really came down to, what that product came down to was, was an app which we named Learn by My Wall Street because it makes sense to name an app after the thing that someone wants to do. Like if you open the app store and you want a radio player, you're going to type in radio player. So we, we launched an app called Learn by My Wall Street, which in so far as possible, has today lift, uplifted millions and millions of lives around the world. It's mobile based. It's really free, properly free. We don't say give us your email. It's just out there, um, which Apple loves and loved and, and Google loved. It's zero jargon. And it's built entirely on the most advanced cognitive psychology in learning. Uh, for example, we all learn best in small bursts. And Duolingo has kind of brought that to life for most of us. And as anyone who's ever held a school or a college book knows, you need to see progress. You need to know how far into that textbook you are. We all did it in college. We, we got a book that looked impossible. But once you, you can observe your progress, you feel good. And we built this seemingly simple product that, in fact, has a lot going on behind the scenes and we just put it out there we built it and we and from we never spent a cent on its promotion and it grew fast as innovative or uplifting products tend to do we tens of thousands of people download it every week and have done for years and years and years and and the feedback we receive on this one of two innovations that we delivered uh, gives me goosebumps to be honest brett and it gives the team goosebumps. Like, for example, a couple of years ago, John was talking to a young woman in, in the Philippines called Michelle, who by our collective Western world standards grew up in, in, in poverty. And she consumed this um, Learn app on a phone she was given on the bus because funnily, it was the only place where she had free Wi-Fi. And she went on to open a brokerage account and invest $5. And she was the only person that she had ever met or spoken to who had invested in, in the stock market. She was the only investor she knew, but she had bought in to the transformational power of long-term buy and hold. And this is one of the countless, and I mean truly countless proof points 
that we had Brett for our target outcome. So once we broke down emotional and rational barriers, what still remained was the question that you and Dark and I, we concern ourselves with all the time, which is what are, to, what are the world's best and what are tomorrow's world's greatest investments? How do we innovate that? Um, and that was the next thing we set about doing. Hmm. So basically starting with the education side, give it away for free. Um, doesn't seem like much of a business model. What What is the business model of my Wall Street? So then how is how does the whole thing, you know, spin? You're right. And actually, what's quite interesting, and I'll, I'll get there, is that we looked at this learning product. And you're absolutely right. It's like we can't run on fumes. We can't just do good. You could have the world's most busiest sandwich shop if you gave out free sandwiches all day. <laughs> <laughs> we, so we didn't want to be that sandwich shop. So, you know, but and it was quite well, interesting. Actually, actually, the point the point is you couldn't have the world's most busiest sandwich shop because you run out of money for ingredients, right? And so you actually have to you have to wrap a business model around it so that you can kind of deliver on the mission, right? And so, yeah, talk about it. You're right. And I, and actually, I, I just as a, a slight digression, like we, we looked at this app of ours and tens of thousands of people downloading it every week. And, and we said, why don't we just charge a dollar for it? So we switched on a charge of a book and downloads dropped by 95%, where previously there was 100,000 downloads. In a few days, it went to 5,000. And we figured we've closed the gate. This is something we, we, that is not the commercialization model. So how did we innovate? So how do we make money? How do we, how do we kind of uh, uh, capitalize our business on our own? And, and that came from answering the question, what shares should I buy? That, ra that, uh, that rational question that everyone has when they're all set up and they've decided to commit and they've done the paperwork, they've opened the account, da 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 da. So what we sat down to do was reverse engineer um, the process of finding great companies that I applied my whole life from when I was just a teenager to find and buy, for example, Netflix, which I bought 20 years ago or, or uh, Tesla, whatever, 15 years ago, I, I, you know, and never sell. And that manifested in our flagship service, which is called Horizon, uh, which is a, a big, bold target of building a model folio uh, with a with a rolling target of 10xing every 12 years, and um, I think unlike Mark, uh, Arc, <laughs> unlike Mark as well, but unlike Arc, um, it's less model driven and more process driven. And I stand to be corrected here because I used to maintain reams and reams and reams of models by hand in 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 the early 90s, and my father. That was like 30 years ago. Uh, and, and the return investment on optimizing a model at that time anyway, was a tiny fraction on the return on investment on optimizing a process. So that process is something that we at My Wall Street have obsessed on. And we codified it, the process which I described to you, which was at a foundational level, had six golden rules that we we don't, insofar as possible, allow anyone deviate from these golden rules. And what we did was we, we maximized the chances of finding and buying tomorrow's giants early. So we, we have a service called Horizon. It's $1,000 a year. So we realized that in the, in the, um, in the audience we've built, there are those who just We'll, we'll walk the path with you fully. Now, we also have many other products to make sure that people are on the right path and picking good stock, but we have a, um, a wonderful product called Horizon. And what it does is it takes the left brain and the right brain, and we I guess we've written an algorithm for finding great investments that bring together the qualitative uh, and the quantitative or the art and the science part of your brain. And, and as we all know, like if you go and buy a car, there's, if you're looking at a car in a showroom, there's two parts of your brain working together. You, you might like the look, the shape, the color, the brand, and they're all kind of artistic right brain things. And then on the numeric side, you have, well, how big is it? How many cup holders? How large is the engine or the battery or how many uh, kilometers, miles will this bring you? So there's a bunch of numbers, there's a bunch of feelings that are crushed together in your mind to derive a single outcome. And with our learning psychologists and with the stuff that we'd, we'd spent a lot of time refining with our learning product, we said, right, this is the 
our secret ingredient, which isn't that big a secret, to be honest, all you have to do is ask me, what is it? And I'll tell you, but <laughs> what is this algorithm for finding uh, tomorrow's greats? How do we truly find the most wonderful businesses of 2032 and buy them today? And I know, Brett, you and I were talking recently and we're, we're in fierce agreement with each other on some of the tomorrow's greatest investments. So uh, essentially, there's a, a a paywall for kind of the content of like these are the companies that we believe in and why we believe in them. Is that the the right way to think? About yeah, it? that's correct. Certainly, what we don't ever want a ticket, a price ticket, to stand in the way of success because the the principles that this business, our mission is to get the world investing successfully, and we're very well aware that the world isn't full of people who are happy and willing and have the means to drop a grand a year. But yes, if you want to get in and find out what shares I, Emmett Savage, I'm buying with my family's money, this is where it's done in a very beautiful way, um, I believe, uh, but I'm totally biased. And that's, that's, how we make, <laughs> that's, how we, that's how we make a living. And, and the, the name of the game now is to build a brand that's known and loved the world over. And it's a long journey. And it's probably a journey that's going to take... Um, more years than I have in my body. I'm, I'm in great health. I'm 47 years of age and I don't drink or smoke or take drugs. But the point I'm saying is we are out to do something that truly is a brand that exists for a very, 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 very long time. And right now, the way we're commercializing is with Horizon by My Wall Street. Got it. You mentioned earlier that kind of like, call it access to investing, all of, all of the, call it the rational reasons why people wouldn't invest if, if evaporated and, and probably even more so. And kind of like your initial story of, of those evaporating was during the dot-com boom. Here we are on, on call it, some past some kind of cycle and on a pretty vicious down cycle in, in kind of the innovation space, at least in terms of markets. Do you think that kind of like the prevalence of retail investors um, is, uh, is that just a cyclical phenomenon that's related to market cycles where now we're going to be in institutional land for a while? Or do you think that there's a structural shift that makes retail investors and kind of like choosing their own stocks and uh, um, just it will forever be here? I think the rise of the retail investor is a secular bull. It, it goes up and up and up and it definitely is two steps forward one step back and i believe that's a trend that we are that's not going to go away you know we, we everybody saw how robin hood just zeroed the commission game but like 20 years before it there was a company called zecco that did the same and they just didn't manage to make it work they couldn't stay capitalized but you know when you look at the teams of individuals today from a non-retail perspective you know, we, we've seen there were hot trends like the SPAC brigade, which for me looked like a mirror image of what happened just almost 20 years to the day previously with the dot-com bubble. But in that bubble burst, what was left in the year, let's just say by summer 2002, where everyone who was going to lose their shirt had lost it, there was a number of people who said, I am, I love that. And one more of that, <laughs> I was one of them. And in what we've just observed, that's happened all over again. And we, we saw in the last couple of quarters reports from Robin Hood that, you know, scorched earth has hurt a lot of people. But in when people pick themselves up and realize I did something wrong, I got caught up, whether it's in the, the meme stock thing or I, I, I was I, I heard about a short squeeze. I don't even know what it is, but I knew I had to buy something. You know, the, these people grow up. In, in years and age and mentality, and they will realize that um, taking a stake in tomorrow's greats is the right thing to do and just leave it. And that's where, bring you back to those six golden rules, if you just ad adhere to those rules, you'll never lose your shirt. You know, you don't make a loss till you've sold. But to your point, yes, I, I, I'm fully believe that retail investing, owning your own, nobody should care, f nobody cares about your financial future more than you. And thanks to ARK, Thanks to my Wall Street, thanks to the Zero Commission Brigade, um, everybody now, the barriers have been dropped. And those speed bumps that previously existed for generations are, are virtually all gone. Yeah. It's interesting that if you go back to the dot com bust, even, you know, the investors that did well are the ones that continued to dollar cost average 
over the course of the cycle. And I'm, and I'm confident the same will be true over the course of this cycle. And, you know, that is potentially um, easier with, with the likes of Robinhood and, and other kind of frictionless delivery of, of investing possibility. There's an interesting intersection, though, at least in my view, between the people get drawn in in part by the excitement of investing. And that also correlates with some of the worst investing behavior. Like, do you think those are uh, kind of extricable factors? Or is, is that just like an inevitable kind of um, uh, way that psychology works? It's like you, you kind of have to be given the gamble in order to get in. And so it's hard to like stop people from from day trading and, and using leverage um, while getting them invested. Yeah, and it's a great question. And it, it, it brings to mind Jason Zweig's book, uh, Your Money and Your Brain, where he says you have to acknowledge that there's a part of your brain that loves a flutter, that wants to have that, that it, it, a part of one's brain lights up when they take a bet. Frankly, I don't think it exists in my mind. And I know <laughs> those who, who know how I invest in my would laugh, the audience laugh, but like, I went to Vegas and I bet 20 bucks because I was like, I, I'm not going to waste, I'm not going to risk this stuff. <laughs> but there is definitely a large part of very, very many brains, for good or bad, more often a male brain that gets an, a hit when they know there's something happened, the race is on, I've bought this thing. And I think that that is codified, it's, it's hardwired into the human brain and I think it will always be in there. And that's why humans have an edge for now on machines because of temperament but it's it's a it's a double edged sword if you control your temperament if you manage your temperament you can out invest by doing exactly what you said Brett which is like dollar cost averaging when times are quote unquote bad such as these i am very excited about stock market right now you and i spoke about a whole pile of stocks recently and and every name you said you know gets me excited excited is a human emotion you know, but once I can harness that excitement and then once I've taken an action, almost brainwash myself into thinking it never happened. When I buy a share, I retire the capital I've appropriated to that particular investment out of my thinking, out of my future plans. And we, we know like what is an investment? Investing is foregoing something today in anticipation of something better in the future. But But if you can just kind of level that down and go, okay, I now own a little bit of Teladoc or CRISPR or a Rocket Lab or whatever, and I'm just going to leave it there for 20 years because one of these, one of these are going to pay off. <laughs> I just don't know which one, you know? Yeah. I mean, I, I guess, do you think part of the challenge or, or from the My Wall Street perspective, these are all true things. And there is business pressure and information pressure and and really like keeping people entertained pressure uh, that that almost you have to go against your own business's interest by not kind of playing to that gambler's psychology. How do you protect even my Wall Street from, from falling into that trap? Or, or how do you think about that? Oh, and it is so it is a real pressure. It is a real pressure. I mean, when we speak to our to our subscribers and members and our loyal backers, more, 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 tell me more. There comes a point where I could sit in front of a screen uh, and talk all day, 24 seven, and it wouldn't be enough. People want more, 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 more. And that's exactly what you're saying. So where we say we've invested in, um, uh, we've invested in CRISPR technologies, let's give it 20 years. People get excited in that moment, and then three days later, they'll be like, so what's happening with CRISPR? You know, like, and that is, so what, what you really, I think what the way one deals with it, and the way my Wall Street is dealing with it, is that reminding people that stock investing goes far beyond wealth creation or some kind of hobby. It's the most comprehensive unending stream of lessons. Stock investing teaches you about everyone else's behavior. It teaches you about human how humankind responds to world events or company specific news. It teaches you about new industries or even old businesses doing something that you never heard of. You learn about how you respond to trouble. It teaches you how to respond next time. It unlocks a deeper sense of purpose. 
And when you start to speak to people in these terms and explain that, look, we're little ships, our little paper ships on, on a pond. We've taken a strategy. We can engage with the fun part. We can talk about Teladoc, sure, seven days a week, but guess what? We're not selling it. The best you're going to hear is we're buying more of it. And, and I guess, you know, it allows you to help others as well by teaching and also economically, when you've actually been a successful investor, it allows you to actually unlock better futures. But I would say that for us, we have to um, maintain the temperament in our tone of voice. We buy and hold, long term buy and hold, and we will constantly update you. But don't expect there to be constant sales. We just don't do that very often. Right. I mean, part of the way we I think address it. Luckily, we were focused just on the technology space and like the underlying technologies are changing so quickly, especially now that, um, you know, for one thing, it means the incremental like allocation of capital, you're constantly assessing where that's going to go. Uh, and kind of like the rate pace of change of the technologies means that there's enough, <laughs> there's enough excitement in technology such that we don't have to, um, you know, deliver people, uh, oh, this is a buyer, this is a sell right now. I, 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 in some ways, I think that the certainly the, the, the mass media landscape is, is so arranged around descriptions of what price signals mean on a day-to-day -day basis. It, it, it encourages misbehavior from individual investors, at least in my view. It does. It does entirely. It's that old adage that, you know, everyone overestimates the short term and underestimates the long term. And when you have TV channels uh, that are shouting at you and coming up next, we've read Hastings talking about the latest squid game. And it's like information. The brain is trying to figure, what do I do with this? You know, but if you can kind of say, well, here's what I'm going to do with it. I'll be entertained by it. And that's the only box I'm going to put it in. I'm not going to start to mix it in with this strategy that I have commit to. So really, you know, just as investors in an ARK ETF or members of Horizon uh, by my Wall Street, we just want them to take the long journey with us. Don't lose your nerve. Keep your nerve. When everybody else is scared, let's all stay cool. We're going to do, we're going to invest more, you know, so and I, I, I yeah, totally get it. How is my Wall Street disruptive in your view? Well, number one, the way we go about teach. So there, there was uh, like, if you take um, the Blue Ocean Strategy book written by, uh, you know, the one I'm talking about. Yes. yes Co-authored. Yes. We took a look at the strategic landscape. We, we went to California and we met the guys from Robin Hood and we went to Jersey City and we met the founders of Drive Wealth and we looked at the brokerage space and realized we can't effectively compete in this. We just can't do it. These guys are hyper capitalized. They've got the best coders, the best talent in the world of uh, SEC licensed bro brokerage firms. So we put a red X through that and said, we are not that. But when we looked at the other side, the blue ocean, the first and foremost was to make sure that there was, it was, it was a great opportunity in the, actually, sorry, let me rewind a tiny bit. If you, if you take an analogy, there are two parties involved when you are feeling sick. There's a doctor and a drugstore and their drugstore is a licensed business and, and, and the pharmacist or the drugstore owner can only give you what the prescription says. That's, they are not allowed. And that's what a broker does. They give you their license to do what it is you instruct them to do. Whereas uh, the doctor in that analogy is the one who brings wisdom, uh, or at least should, who's the one who brings uh, a voice of authority and who also kind of brings a calming voice. And that was an area that we saw was being ignored in the hot pit race that was in the brokerage world. The race to zero had happened. We weren't going to join it. So we said, we are going to take every element of human temperament and investing and picking winning stocks and codify it in a way that nobody else has done and deliver it to the masses. So our innovation came from getting very academically pursued how to teach investing well and how to make sure we're picking tomorrow's giants and we're telling people and we're reassuring people they have the right strategy with the right data at the right time. So we make sure we, we can tell if Brett Winton Jr., if you're 
if your son is about to hop on that sell button by telling everyone to calm down, we have a, we've built a wonderful set of tools that make sure people just go the long journey. So our innovation comes from the other side of the ocean away from brokerage. We have an SEC licensed business, but it, it's just there. It just sits there where we really innovate and where we are dedicated to continuing innovating is picking winning stocks and making sure it's wrapped with the right strategy. It's interesting because it sounds, you know, there's a lot of probably a lot of financial advisors that listen to this podcast, but certainly I'd spend a lot of time talking to financial advisors, at least in the US. And what I say to them, they're a common question is, well, how is AI going to displace us? And and um, kind of my answer is that the the role that you're playing for people is not actually financial advice strictly it's really psychologists and that that the the job of the financial advisors is to prevent the person from selling at the worst possible time and prevent them from buying or borrowing and buying at the at the worst possible time and um it seems like my wall street is trying to do that but in a kind of packaged for you know anybody can access basis do you think that uh, more personalization is like the direction of travel for the business? Like, do you think that you could take what you're doing with my, my Wall Street and make it more customized to the person, their particular life situation or their particular, call it predilections for, for risk? Or, or, or is that a possible development angle? Yeah, no doubt about it. No, there's no doubt about it. And we have a good read on about 5 million of the people who've engaged with our products. We understand what motivates them. Um, we understand uh, the, the building blocks of their psyche. We understand that not only from what they use, because you we measure what people do. People tell you what they want, and then they use a product, and they show you what they need. And we take those together. And we have not, at this time, decided to carve it into five distinct workflows. It's just not right for our business yet. But there's no question or doubt, Brett, that yes, that is where we are going and what we are going to do. But I think, you know, um, the first platform, Basecamp won for us, um, going up Everest of building a global brand, is to make sure that the things we do are as close to perfect as possible. And I know perfect's the enemy of good, but as, as close to damn great as possible before we start to partition it down and say, right, we understand that you are a 55-year-old teacher in Nebraska and you over here are a 21-year-old Silicon Valley worker who is like YOLO. And we but we know you're we know where they are. We have heat maps of where these people are and what they're doing, what they need, and the customization of messaging. Not necessarily the strategy, but of messaging is very important because ultimately we remember feelings. We remember and when someone says the right thing to any of us at the right time, we all know the impact it can have. You know, we've all we've every single one of us has an autobiography and it's of things that people said just at the right time that saved us from doing something that just uh, was suboptimal. Yeah, it, it does seem like in, in some ways the the strategy here or or put another way um you know are you in some ways in competition with robo advisors do you think we are now but we uh, yes but um that doesn't say we're not going to build a robo advisory I, I we have a data warehouse packed with data <laughs> and we have we um we are exploring ways to get up the robo advisor ladder more efficiently than those who've gone before us. And there's names that jump into mind, um, but I'm not here to diss them, but the robo-advisor output has just not performed despite big brands behind them and huge names. And, you know, so it is just inevitable. It is inevitable uh, that AI and robo-advisors will overtake us eventually. And the things that we have an edge on right now, which is generally the right brained activities, the qualitative activities or attributes that we look at in businesses, they're still processed better by a human brain, but soon enough, they'll be codified very, very well. And we'll be able to take out the weaknesses of human temperament. But for now, I still think it's the human edge. So for now, my Wall Street's front face is human led. We have a team of really, really um, wonderful stock analysts and commentators, and we do it in the right way at the right time. But yeah, I think robo is, you know, it's the unmissable charge. Yeah, I wonder about, or I guess my the way I've thought about, call it the 
distribution challenges that robo advisors have faced is that it's um it is hard to kind of sell people without a story and you know the the there is a um both a i want to be smarter than the average bear mentality where i you know i think i can beat what what everybody else is doing and that like potentially helps you to stay in market if you if you really believe in the companies that you're investing in. And so if your assets are stuck, like you've been told, you're just supposed to put assets into this thing, but but then maybe the average investor actually gets scared out of the allocation to the robo-advisory at the, at the wrong time because they don't really get what the underlying companies they're investing in are. And that's really true. And as humans, we st- we still and always will connect with humans. I mean, I've no doubt, you know, every country has more celebrity chefs than you could even name. I could probably name more celebrity chefs than I could celebrity footballers. And the fact remains is they could produce TV programming that shows me how to cook something without a human being. But that's not interesting. You want to, he- there's, there's just, we are human creatures. We need to hear that person whose personality we've started to learn about. If you look at Ark Invest, you, Kathy, they're human beings who we trust. We look at the, the people, we see them, we hear them, we go, yeah, that person means what they say. When someone looks at my Wall Street, they hear me and Maury and my team, and they know that we aren't, we eat our own cooking. We invest first with our money, and then we speak to other people. And robo and algorithmic investing really lacks that thing. You know, um, we can argue that robotics powered by AI will eventually or do whatever it is we want it to do. You get, uh, virtually. But the, the fact remains is in this chapter of humanity, we connect with human beings and human beings out front of a service such as the one you might have uh, robos helping you identify great stocks and great investments. But I think at the end of the day, a human being will always be at the front of my Wall Street. I mean, and I think another kind of way to think about the challenge of, of call it rules-based investing, and you can make the rules as as complex as you want, um, is that markets are recursive. And so like any investment style that propagates and becomes dominant, that gets really broadly distributed, you know, necessarily kind of like overvalues the things it's inefficiently exposed to, uh, and then leaves, leaves, you know, net present value, inefficiently priced assets behind. And so there's a there's always a yin and yang between, you know, we look at kind of index investing and, and how we think that's impacting um, companies. And, and even like uh, in, in some ways, like an index is itself, uh, um, you know, a rules based investing framework. Uh, and so, you know, that it took so long for Tesla to be included in the S&P 500 was a huge inefficiency. Uh, and it would not surprise me if there's actually that's the direction the trend goes where companies forestall, you know, on paper profitability for as long as possible to, to expand the size of their platform. So then they get included later into the index. And so then people following those rules and, and the reason you do the whole index is to diversify, but also to own the two or three companies that are actually going to deliver most of the returns that matter in that year. Well, if those, if one of those three companies is actually held out of the index for that year, it really kind of distorts the, the exposures that you have. Um, so I, th- I think that there's a, there's a, the recursiveness of markets actually like really guards against any kind of rules-based strategy dominating for a prolonged period of time. It's a very good point. I mean, the minute you put something out there to exploit a gap, that gap will close in milliseconds. And an example, there's many, many examples, but there was a great book written years ago by Joel Greenblatt uh, called The Little Book That Beats the Market, I think. And um, he, I think he's this head of this, the business school in Columbia University. I'm not sure, but you know, it was algorithmic based investing with a simple rule and it was back tested. So, I mean, the book was effectively proving the system with data, but the minute the book took to the top shelf and this magic formula investing, it was the end. I, I mean, I hope I haven't checked it in the last couple of years, but certainly the last time I looked, I went, well, this isn't working anymore. So um, I completely agree with you time and time again, the minute a magic formula is out there, the magic ceases to exist. Yeah. Well, Emmett, I wish you 
luck in continuing to create magic at my Wall Street, and I enjoyed the conversation. Uh, This has been FYI, the For Your Innovation podcast. Please subscribe and like in your podcasting platform of choice. Thank you, Emmett. Nice chatting with you. Thanks for having me, Brett. Really enjoyed it. All right. Cheers. ARC believes that the information presented is accurate and was obtained from sources that ARC believes to be reliable. However, ARC does not guarantee the accuracy or completeness of any information, and such information may be subject to change without notice from ARC. Historical results are not indications of future results. Certain of the statements contained in this podcast may be statements of future expectations and other forward-looking statements that are based on ARC's current views and assumptions, and involve known and unknown risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results, performance, or events to differ materially from those expressed or implied in such statements.